our exclusive interview with WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, who sparked a global uproar with his release of hundreds of thousands of pages of secret government documents and diplomatic cables. Information ranging from the outrageous, we had innocent and unarmed reporters and Iraqi civilians being killed by U.S. troops, to the downright embarrassing comments about the hard partying and the corruption of different world leaders. Not long after that latest release, Assange found himself in legal trouble in Sweden, but not for any reason having to do with the leaks. Instead, he was booked on a series of sex charges. With the help of people like American filmmaker and activist Michael Moore, Mr. Assange is now out on bail and speaking out to us. Let's now go to Elliam Hall in Norfolk, England, where Julian Assange is currently on house arrest. Julian, great to have you with us. Good evening, Hank. All right. Uh, first question I have for you, Julian, is uh, do you consider yourself a member of the press? Uh, are you a journalist? Well, I have been a member of the Australian Press Union for many years. I co-authored my first book when I was 25 and have been involved in setting up the, the very fabric of the Internet in Australia since 1993 uh, as a publisher. So... Um, quite interesting that this is something that has been raised. It's, it's actually a quite deliberate uh, attempt to split off our organisation from the First Amendment uh, protections that are afforded uh, to all publishers. You know, as time has gone by um, and our journalism has increased, um, I've been pushed up into senior management into a position where well, I manage other journalists. Um, I now even in a position where I'm managing the interrelations between uh, Guardian, Spiegel, New York Times, Al Jazeera and so on, which we used uh, in, in our last production. So, uh, yes, unfortunately, I don't write that much anymore um, because I'm busy being editor-in-chief, coordinating the actions of other journalists. But quite deliberate attempt to split us off uh, in the mind of the public from those good traditions of the United States protecting the rights of the press uh, to publish, to split us off from the support uh, of the press in the United States, the support of uh, journalists. Some of those journalists have fallen for that. And why? Because they're worried that they're going to be next. They believe that if they sell us out, if they say, well, he's not really a journalist, um, they can have the uh, you have the Washington authorities target us and destroy us and somehow uh, steer clear of the crossfire, which they worry will, will scatter out to all journalists. But I have a message to them. Uh, they're going to be next. Uh, and we've seen these statements that the New York Times is, is you know, not also I mean, looked at in terms of uh, whether it has engaged in what they call uh, conspiracy uh, to con commit espionage. So, uh, us journalists and publishers and writers, uh, we all have to stick together uh, to resist this sort of reinterpretation uh, of the First Amendment, this attempt to use the 1917 Espionage Act, something that was put in place uh, in the middle of World War, towards the end of World War I, uh, in the middle of the US involvement in World War I, uh, to stop bona fide espionage in World War I. Now we've got this antiquated act that they are trying to apply to publishers, arguably unconstitutional, but that will take many years to get through the court. And in the meantime, what happens? Uh, in the meantime, we have our people harassed. We have calls to apply this uh, to, to other newspapers. So all members of the press and, and all the American people who believe in freedom and the, and the good founding principles of, revolution, of the Revolutionary Fathers have got to pull together and resist this attack on the First Amendment. And do you think they have pulled together, or do you think that uh, large portions of whether it's the American media or the international media have abandoned you and, and not come to your defense when uh, people in government call you a high-tech terrorist? Yeah, well, they were. They were. But we saw a bit of a shift around um, 10 days ago. You know, once I was put in prison, this really focused the minds of people intently into what was happening. So we, we have seen a turnaround. We saw the, the House Judiciary uh, com Committee um, I issue a, a finding that this would be a, a grave step and, and an attack on the First Amendment. We've seen the New York-based uh, Human Rights Watch uh, saying that this would be a very grave step and should not be done 
Uh, we're seeing reporters uh, without borders uh, issue an open letter uh, to Obama uh, condemning uh, that sort of interpretation. And we have seen a number of members of the mainstream press rightly uh, stepping forward and, and understanding uh, that there has to be a line drawn in the sand, uh, that this erosion uh, of the First Amendment must be stopped. And so I'm quite hopeful about that. I think um, people uh, are seeing that it's going too far. You know, always in this sort of situation, you have an institution like the State Department uh, connected with military contractors and an institution like the Pentagon, an institution like the CIA, able to respond fairly quickly and get its agenda up fairly quickly because they're organized, they have a chain of command, they have internal email communications and uh, systems, they have existing contacts with the press, they spend enormous amount of money on public relations, so they're able to get their message out quickly. But the reality is that a large sway of the population sees things differently, not just in the United States, but in Australia, my home country, um, where the, the Prime Minister uh, made similar sort of statements to the United States. Now that's completely turned around in Australia, and Australians have gotten together well, uh, to even take out a full-page ad uh, in the New York Times uh, condemning uh, that, that sort of behaviour. As time goes by, the large number of people, the silent majority, uh, start to become organised. And that's what we've seen uh, over the last two or so weeks, the gradual organisation of the silent majority to resist a new type of tyranny, a new type of privatised censorship, a new type of um, digital McCarthyism uh, that is being pushed from Washington. People don't like it. Around the world, people don't like it. They don't like it in the United States, especially because of these good First Amendment revolutionary traditions about the rights and freedoms of all people to criticise and open up their government. Well, Julian, I want to get to as much as possible here. So I want to give you a chance to respond one by one to your critics. First to uh, Mitch McConnell, who is, of course, the leader of the Republicans in the Senate, and to Joe Biden, who both said that called you a high-tech terrorist. How do you respond to, to Joe Biden, the vice president of the United States, saying that to you? Well, let's look at the definition of terrorism. The definition of terrorism is a group that uses violence or the threat of violence for political ends. Now, no one in our four-year publishing co country covering over 120 countries has ever been physically harmed as a result of what we have done. Now, that's not just us saying that. It's the Pentagon saying that. That's NATO in Kabul saying that. Um, no one, not a shred of evidence. Now, believe me that if they could find or even easily manufacture a shred of evidence, they would be doing that immediately. So it's clear that whoever the terrorists are here, it's not us. But we see constant threats uh, from people in the you know, Republicans in the Senate trying to make a, a name for themselves, to people uh, like Sarah Palin, to shock jocks uh, on Fox, and unfortunately some uh, members also uh, of the Democratic Party calling for my assassination, calling for the illegal kidnapping of my staff. And, and just a few days ago in Fox, that was the phrase that was used, illegal. He should be illegally murdered uh, if necessary assassinated by the law if possible, if not illegally. What sort of message does that send about the rule of law uh, in the United States? That is conducting violence in order to achieve a political end, the elimination uh, of this organisation, or the threat of violence uh, to achieve a political end, the elimination of a publisher. Uh, and that uh, is the definition of terrorism. Uh, now, I, I want to give you a chance to respond personally, though, because the, here Mike Huckabee is making it very personally. You saw that quote we had up. He says, I think anything less than execution is too kind a penalty for you. Sarah Palin saying that uh, you are like Al Qaeda and the Taliban and he, you should be pursued with the same urgency. So how would you respond to Mike Huckabee, who is a top Republican leader, likely to run for president again? How would you respond to Sarah Palin, top Republican leader who might run for president again? Oh, he's just another idiot trying to make a name for himself. But it's a, it's a serious business. I mean, uh, if we are to have a civil society, you cannot have 
senior people making calls on national TV to go around the judiciary and illegally murder people. That is incitement to commit murder. That is an offence. You cannot have senior people on national TV asking people to commit an offence. Um, that is not a country that obeys the rule of law. Is, does the United States obey the rule of law? Because Europeans are starting to wonder uh, whether it is still obeying the rule of law. And it needs to be very careful. Um, is it going to descend into an anarchy uh, where we don't have due process, uh, where those great um, Bill of Rights traditions about due process are just thrown to the wind uh, whenever some uh, shock jock politician thinks that they can use it uh, to make a name for themselves? Uh, or do we take things according to laws expressly made by the people and their representatives? That is the way things should be done. And, and when people call for illegal, deliberate assassination and kidnapping of others, they should be held to account. They should be charged for incitement to commit murder. Well, that's a very strong charge, and what they're saying is very strong. Uh, well, what's actually happened, the only person who's actually been arrested on any leak is actually Private Bradley Manning. Uh, he's actually been in uh, prison for the last seven months. I know you spent a, a week in prison, and you got a, a little sense of how bad it could be. He's uh, had 200 days of solitary confinement in a small cell for 23 hours a day. He gets a 5 a.m. wake-up call. He's not even allowed to ha exercise in his cell, <laughs> not allowed to have sheets or a pillow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people, uh, including some of the top human rights analysts in, in the world, believe that this is cruel and inhumane treatment. Do you think uh, Private Manning is, one, a hero? And number two, do you think the American government is treating him wrong by keeping him in isolation for so long? We don't know whether this young man is our source or not. Our technology is set up, so we don't know that. That is the best way to protect people. But let's look at the allegations. Regardless of whether um, he was the whistleblower behind some of these re revelations or not, uh, he is a young man that has been caught up in this, uh, kept in solitary confinement for some six months, uh, some 5,000 hours uh, now, in conditions... Uh, that were even worse um, than the ones that I was in. Uh, held in a, he's now held in a, in a military brig. His uh, visits um, are very limited, uh, only once a week. Uh, and his lawyer has said that they've been getting worse and that his psychological health has been getting worse. If we are to believe the allegations, then this man acted for political reasons. He is a political prisoner in the United States. He has not gone to trial. He's been a political prisoner without trial in the United States for some six or seven months. That's a serious business. Human rights organizations should be investigating the conditions under which he's held and is there really due process there. Now, we've recently heard calls to try and set up a plea deal uh, with Bradley Manning uh, to testify against me personally to say that we engaged in some kind of conspiracy to commit espionage. Now, absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. That's not how our technology works, well, not how organizations work. I never heard uh, of the name Bradley Manning before it appeared in the media. But actually, mainstream journalists in the United States, mainstream investigative journalists, how do they operate when they're investigating a story? They do actually ring up their sources and say, do you have anything on this? That is how they operate. Uh, and if we are to, if they want to push the line that um, when a, a newspaperman talks to someone in the government about looking for things uh, relating to potential abuses, uh, that that is a conspiracy to commit espionage, then that's going to take out all the good government journalism uh, that occurs in the United States. And fortunately, as an organization, we're not too exposed to that because that's not how our technology works. But other journalists are, and they need to take action now. And they need to understand another thing, that in this case of Bradley Manning, his conditions have been getting worse and worse and worse in his cell as they attempt to pressure him into testifying against me. That's a serious problem. Right. 
Right. Ju Julian, and I want to let the audience know that uh, uh, Private Manning, of course, has not been convicted of anything. He's in isolation as we keep our most serious criminals, even though he has not been convicted. But Julian Assange, we, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you for joining us. No worries. Merry Christmas. And, um, all right. Merry Christmas to you as well.